so excited to be with you on the second webinar and to be able to take our learning to a whole new level here with Stacy. To make this Learning Lab possible, we have a sponsor and we're going to just start with our message from True Shield Insurance. So have a listen to this because without True Shield, it would be very hard for us to do programs like the Learning Lab. Whoopee, where's the sound? <laughs> So when she approached us with helping out with their new learning lab initiative, how could we say no? We're very proud to be a part of providing online resources for entrepreneurial women who want to grow and succeed in business. You can join us. All of us here at True Shield are super excited about the wonderful work that she is doing. Thank you to True Shield and your work that you're doing and for supporting us at the Learning Lab here with Shio. So I like to call this section, how do you get the most out of the Learning Lab? The first thing to do if you haven't already done so is to download the um, canvas we have, which is the Insights to Action Canvas. And please take notes as you go because we want you to be inspired, but we also want you to be in action after this Learning Lab. There's a number of ways to engage. And this is what this canvas looks like. You should have received it with your registration. So download that now if you don't already have it. Also, open your chat and I see already people saying hi. Hi, Diane in Vancouver. I see we've got Emma from Halifax. Um, sunny Florida, we've got Erica, and we can happily say sunny Toronto too today. And uh, um, it looks like Aisi in Vancouver, I hope I said that right. We've got Jill in Denver, so we've got a lot of people saying hi, and I love that you're all saying hi from where you are. And we've got Australia on the line, Sydney, hello. So you're already starting to use our chat to just do the kind of things we want, which is to introduce ourselves to each other and ask questions. I will do my best to get your questions in as Stacy is leading, but at the end of our learning lab at, at uh, on the hour, eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time, five o'clock um, on the West Coast, we will stay on for 15 minutes longer for pure Q&A with Stacy. So if you can stay with us past the hour, we'll stay with you. Also, there will be a Slack channel where you will be able to exchange your ideas, your thoughts, your contributions to this conversation. And finally, give us your feedback. We got lots of feedback after our first learning lab. Thank you to all of you who did that. And we listened to a lot of your feedback and that's why we've already made changes for this learning lab. Okay, now to the good stuff. Stacy <laughs> Berry is our guest today. And Stacy hails from the greater Toronto area, although not in the downtown core. And we are so excited to have her leading this topic of speaking with confidence anywhere, anytime, to any audience. I'm going to send this over to Stacy now to say some words, introduce herself, and uh, tell us a little bit about her entrepreneurial journey. So Stacy, over to you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in, and thank you to Shio for having me. I'm really excited for today's Learning Lab. So just a little background, my entrepreneurial journey, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur because it was not my plan A, B, or C. I actually, it grew out of my natural ability to just create my own opportunities, and I wanted to do something where I could monetize my skills, my passion, but also make an impact. My original career choice was to actually be a lawyer. And I did everything to prepare for law school as a high school student right up to university. And I did apply, but I didn't get in. So then you say to yourself, what next? And so I ended up you know, working in the government and then I was laid off. And that happening also kind of led me to really tap into myself, look deeper into my skills and my talents and figure out what kind of company could I make that would allow me to do the workshop facilitation that I've been doing in community for years and just the type of way that I give back and I do some consulting for nonprofits and things of that nature. But these are things I've been doing my whole life. So one of the things that I really appreciate about being able to be a professional as well as be an entrepreneur is that it really propelled me to get out of my comfort zone, especially being an entrepreneur. I had to figure things out, ask the right questions, go to the source of the information to get the accurate information and then just learn as I went along. So this just really helped to give me the skills that I, that I need to really be a good entrepreneur. So that's a little bit about me. So my objective for tonight's call though, is to help, to help you to become in tune with your voice 
And I hope that you'll feel empowered to use it. We all have a voice, but at times we just don't feel empowered. And there's several reasons for that. Hopefully we can talk about that a little bit later. I'm also going to share key elements of effective public speaking. And lastly, provide you with some practical tools to help you deliver your message with confidence. Thank you, Stacey. It sounds great. And you know, Stacey, why don't we just unpack this title a little bit? Because mm -hmm. speaking with confidence, our last learning lab was about uh, the, the topic of, you know, owning your power. And we talked about confidence there. And now we're talking about confidence again. So mm -hmm. Just unpack a little bit more this this topic about speaking with confidence and, uh, and a little bit about what that means for you personally. Right. So for me, it's your ability to be really decisive, being sure of yourself, trusting yourself in your own skills and your ability. And as women, sometimes we're really hesitant to speak up, to speak out. Um, we, we doubt our own ability and sometimes we downplay our own successes. And that can make us hesitant to speak with confidence. And for me, when it comes to owning your power, it's our ability to be clear on what you want, um, your ability to know your value. And sometimes we don't know our value. Do a values assessment. We have a lot of great things that we're bringing to the table as women, especially women in business and professional women. And then lastly, asking for what you want and then knowing what to say no to, right? Yes. Really confident people are good at knowing what to say no to. So we don't have to say yes to everything because we're asked to it. Yeah. And it's interesting because I do think one of the greatest exercises to build your confidence is to, to say no a couple of times. Exactly. Really put up your boundaries. It's great. Mm -hmm. Well, let's then dive into your first key point here, the power of your voice. Yes. Speak a little bit about that in your experience and expertise, Stacey. Of course. So it took me a while to, to realize that my voice even had power. Growing up, I was very shy extremely nervous to do public speaking. You know, of course, the school setting is the first place where you'll get a chance to speak in front of your classmates. I would do everything to avoid it. And, you know, of course, the nerves would get the best of me. But over time, I got to a place where I realized I'm not going to get rid of this fear and the nervousness. And being nervous is actually not a bad thing. It's just energy. You need to know how to channel it. So I just got to a place where I had to just feel the fear and do it anyway. And so there's just a few key things that I did to help me get there, which helped to build my confidence as a speaker over time. I'll share two key things with you. So first, I practiced public speaking. I started in small settings with, you know, in social events with people who I knew. And then I would start to speak in just larger audience. So at my churches, for example, just, you know, doing different uh, speeches there on different things, community groups. Then, you know, once I became a graduate at York University, I was speaking in front of hundreds of people. I was I'm constantly requested to be on panels and to be a keynote at my alma mater, spoken at other universities. So I went from speaking in small settings to large settings. And then secondly, a second thing I did was to take a leap of faith. I think we may have a question coming in, Marisha. Well, you know, I was just wondering, Stacey, because to take us back a couple steps before you even start speaking in a small group, let's just mm -hmm. say some of um, the women joining us today are saying, yeah, that's great, but how do you even take the step from not speaking in a group or even having your voice be heard in a meeting? And there's a lot of powerful women out there right now. So some of you, this may be just, you know, like you're done this part. But for those of you who may for the first time be stepping out there, what was it that allowed you to bridge from not even having that confidence to get there mm -hmm. to be able to take it to that next level? Well, some of the things that really helped me, and there's two, positive affirmations and positive self-talk. You literally have to be your own life coach. You have to start there because this ability to speak with confidence comes from you. Like if you don't believe in yourself, it's going to be hard to convince others. So I spent a lot of time making positive affirmations um, as well as even visualization is another technique. So you literally visualize yourself speaking in front of a small group and then a larger group, which are techniques I use when I do my workshop called Face Your Fear of Public Speaking. And so those are the techniques I had to do before, like you said, going from a small, intimate setting to the larger setting. And as time went on and the more I practiced, because that's always key, I was able to feel more confident as time goes on. And Stacey, do you ever find yourself in front of a mirror or maybe recording your voice just to hear it, to see what it sounded like, to get a sense of that then what that would look like in a, in a venue of five people, 10 people, then, as you said, eventually to hundreds? Yes, I have. And I'm going to talk about that further a little later. So I recorded myself just to hear my own voice. And one of the biggest, uh, I guess, challenges that I have, I'm a fast talker. And that could be really difficult uh, for audiences that are, you know, diverse, different cultures, different age groups. So I 
constantly having to remind myself to slow down. And so it wasn't until I recorded myself when I heard how quickly I could speak and just hear my own pitch, my own tone, my own flow of how I speak. Those are different things to look for when it comes to public speaking. Sure, I can relate to the speaking quickly. Yes. <laughs> Some of you out there have maybe have already noticed my Toronto accent. I need to slow down a little bit so you get what I'm saying. Thank you. Yuck. Yes. What else in this area, Stacey, anything else to add to the... Yes, I have some things to add. So what I was going to get into is the importance of just taking a leap of faith. So as I said before, you're going to feel the fear. Just do it anyway. The more you do it, the more you practice, is the more you'll feel comfortable with public speaking. So one of the ways I took a leap of faith and completely stepped out of my comfort zone. So before I went to grad school, I designed a one-on-one -on -one public speaking course for a client of mine, and he found it very beneficial. And he said to me, I think you should be teaching this at the college level. And I'm like, college? I don't even have a master. It's like, I don't think I'm qualified. He said, but you're really good and I find this valuable. So then I'm the type of person that will cold call, reach out and knock on doors. I'm that kind of person. So I started with Seneca College because that's, I'm an alumni. So I reached out and I said, do you guys have any, need any instructors to teach public speaking? And at the time they were a little taken back. There was no posting for that. So I reached out and I said, you know what? I just want to meet with you. And I finally got a response after reaching out several times to the, at the continuing education department. I got a response. I said, I'd like to just come in and show you the course that I designed. So when I showed uh, the lady who eventually hired me, she just looked at me and looked at what I designed and said, we have to get you teaching. You're naturally a teacher. This is great. So at that point, I was asked to design three our seminars, success seminars are called, public speaking was one of them, customer service and goal setting. So then I found myself with my confidence building up even more. A lot of the people in my class, my students, they were older than me. These were professionals and I'm this young person coming in teaching them about all these topics. But that really helped to boost my confidence because as you know, as college instructors and professors were evaluated and it's anonymous. So you don't know, you know who it could be. So they're free to say good or bad things. And I got a lot of positive reviews. And that's when I really said, I got to tie this into my company and do this workshop facilitation. So those are some of the ways I took a leap of faith, stepped out of my comfort zone, which really helped me to build my confidence further. Stacy, did you have any setbacks in that original journey? And if you did, how did you recover from those? Well, definitely the setbacks were going months with no response. I mean, I did send not just to Seneca, but several other colleges. I followed up by email, I called, I left messages and I was thinking, See, maybe I'm too young. Maybe I'm not qualified. Maybe there is no opportunity. Of course, you start doubting yourself. But then there's something in you that just makes you push a little further. Try again. And that's what I did. And when you get that one yes, you're like, oh, somebody has read my email. And of course, I was excited and then overjoyed when I actually was hired to be a college instructor. Yeah, it's great. I think of the analogy, if you only swing the bat once, you probably won't you know, get to first base or never hit a home run. So you got to keep swinging, right? Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Good. Yeah. So uh, some other things that I want to share in terms of ways to deliver your message with confidence, you know, so we spent some time talking about what confidence means to me. So think about what confident, being confident means to you. So confident people are clear on who they are and they know what they value. Okay? They also know their value. And so having a sense of self, self acceptance is also a key part of confidence, knowing what your weaknesses are, your strengths are, but then you want to maximize your strengths and play, play them up a bit more at uh, being yourself and not hiding behind an image. Being comfortable in your own skin, which is something that takes you know, a struggle for some people to be comfortable in their own skin, but getting to that level is a sign of confidence. And as well as when you uh, deliver your message, you wanna just do it with a sense of assurance without doubt. Fearlessness is really another element of being confident. Stacey, and so those I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump in again because there, you know, and it's just that, hot, but. How do you access that if you don't have it to begin with? Like what's been, or how do you, how would you coach someone mm -hmm. who you, you know, they've got it and, or you may even wonder if they've got it, but you know, right. they got to keep putting themselves out there. How do you help them to do that? Yeah. Well, I mean, to help them to do that, one of the things I say, to, I mentor students as well, not just, you know, uh, giving consultation advice to my clients, but it's also important to surround yourself with people who want the best for you, who will kind of, you know, be your coach if you're not able to coach yourself. So it's important to really surround yourself with people who value and respect you, will help you get to that place. So you want to start there. The positive affirmations is a good way, even writing down some affirmations, reading books on positive affirmations, making your own, and saying them daily if you have to are a great way to help you get to that place if you're struggling to get to that place. Great, thanks. It's great. Mm -hmm. 
And so another tip I want to share to help you speak with confidence is speaking up even when fear is present. And I talked about just feeling the fear and doing it anyway. There's times when we get caught up in the opinions of others, we're, we're fearful of rejection of what people will think. So we hold back our voice. We don't speak up. We don't speak in those meetings when we're the only woman or the only person of color, which sometimes is a situation I'm often in an executive meeting. And so you really have to get to that place where I know I'm terrified, I might make a mistake, somebody might laugh at me, who cares? Speak up anyway, right? And getting to that place does take time and it's, it's not easy, but we can get there. So that's, now we're, mm -hmm. that's your point number two, right? Finding your voice? Yes, we're getting into yeah. finding your voice. Awesome, like good, good, good. Yeah. Yeah. So any other questions coming in so far before I move along? Well, what's happening actually is just a lot of people are sort of echoing your, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And I think sort of giving a high five that, yeah, they can, they, they're reflecting their own, their own experience. For example, Christine is saying, mm -hmm. you know, daily affirmations are important. Speak up even when fearful of rejection. Mm -hmm. Emily, mm -hmm. do you have a question? You can type it out. And I also have one from Sylvie, which is how do you deal with the imposter syndrome? Mm, the imposter syndrome. That's, that's, yeah, I've heard of that. That could be a little bit of a challenge. How do you deal with it? Hmm. I mean, for me, you have to be at a place where you're not so concerned without, with what people think of you. Because it's, it's always better to be your authentic self because when that mask falls off, then it's like, you're gonna break trust with people and that's gonna affect your reputation, right? And your reputation is golden. So for me, like, I'm just very careful with making sure I'm my, I'm my authentic self and I'm comfortable about something before I say it and I can stand behind what I say. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, there is that uh, possibility that if you feel like on your own, you can't do it, you can hire a coach or work with yeah. a mentor, right? Stacy, yeah. you've done that or seen people do that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so in terms of recognizing our voice on uh, point two, it, we have to get to a place where we believe that our voice has power. We right. believe that, you know, we can make an influence and our voice can be impactful and that what we have to say is important and it has meaning. And we do live in a world, especially where as women, there's other parts of the world where women don't have the power and the opportunity to speak up and choose their voice and they're told not to speak because of their gender. You know, so in North America, we're very privileged where we do have that opportunity, but it's not to say we don't have the same kind of uh, challenges in some settings, depending on your social economic background as well. So there's a few ways you can strengthen your voice so that you can deliver your message um, in a more impactful way. So we talked a little about a bit about the fact that I recorded my voice to hear how I sound. So I want to encourage you to take the time to assess the sound of your voice. Listen for your tone, your speed, and your pitch, your volume. Some people will, like myself, sometimes if I'm doing, um, when I did my promo video, which I didn't notice until my video uh, videographer pointed out that you started off at a great volume, then your voice went down really low. Those are the things you want to listen for when you're recording your voice. Also listen for your pronunciation of words and your enunciation of words. Women uh, tend to, not all women, but some tend to speak in a high pitch and that's typically associated with a child. So when it comes to, you know, going into that boardroom meeting where you're supposed to just take charge and, and speak with confidence, if that's how your voice sounds, it might be hard for people to take what you're saying seriously. But again, you have to look for the strengths and the weakness and the sounds of your voice, knowing when and how to use it. Um, and so another thing like you could do is instead of just listening to the audio, you want to record yourself on camera. What is your body language doing, right? When you're speaking, is your body language matching your message, right? Those are the things you want to look for when you record yourself. Are you speaking from your diaphragm? Do you have correct posture, right? So these are the key elements of effective public speaking that I teach in my workshop. Stacey, another question for you. Let's say you go into a setting and it's not necessarily public speaking, but you walk into a boardroom mm -hmm. or a meeting place and you look around the table and you don't see anyone who looks like you, whether it be gender, color mm -hmm. your skin, mm -hmm. the way they operate. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you found yourself in a situation like that and how you, you know, recommend to others how to deal with that. Yeah, so I am in a situation like that. Um, I'm, on a, I'm on a municipal board, a government board, where um, there's no one who has my skin complexion there. Yeah. But nonetheless, one of the things that I've been able to 
be good at over time is relationship building and just not being afraid to go and say, hi, I'm Stacy. how are you? Great to meet you. And sometimes I've gotten, a, oh, she's coming over and saying hi, but you have to just constantly do that because then it kind of breaks this ice or these perceptions that we may think people have because we're women, because we're a person of color. And so for me, just that, just saying hi to people helps, introducing yourself really helps. And at first I was very afraid to speak up in this type of meeting because with this municipal board, the issues usually make the headline it's always recorded because it's with city councillors, it's with doctors, it's a very high level stuff that we're dealing with. So it took me a while to even say anything because I was trying to adjust to the culture, you know, the climate, what are the issues, and spent a lot of time researching. Because when you do speak, you want to know what you're talking about, you want to know, you know, the culture so that you kind of stay within that. And then if you need to advocate on something, you know, you do it accordingly in time. But it took me a while to get comfortable with that because it can feel intimidating, to be honest. Right, right. And have you ever been surprised when you think that maybe there's a difference, but then when you connect with people, you realize, wow, actually. Exactly. It was like a misconception. And there's a lot of similarities that you wouldn't think you may have with, say, fellow board member just because of perception. So it's, for me, very important to just really talk to people one-on-one -on -one and find those similarities because I, I really believe we're more alike than we are different. Yeah, that's a great philosophy, Stacey. Mm -hmm. Can we go to your next point or do you have anything else to add on this one? Yeah, just something quickly to add. So when you are trying to develop, you know, better speaking skills, observe other strong speakers, not just women, but also men as well. And look at their body language because a body language is 70% of the message we said, right? And so when you're looking at journalists, those for me are great examples because of course they're trained and how to conduct themselves on TV, but look at how they present themselves and their body language. Look at presidential debates. We have a provincial election happening right now. It's a great time to see what um, kind of messages are these uh, political candidates sending with their body language. So that's a good way to sometimes make some notes as well. Make a list of speakers who impress you, right? So some of my favorite speakers are Sheryl Sandberg, of course, Michelle Obama and Oprah. I just think they command the audience really well. And so those are some of the things that has helped me that I think will help you. There also are three videos I'd like to recommend if you don't mind noting them down. They're great videos. You can access them on Facebook. So one is called Top 10 Ways to Get What You Want Using Body Language by Janine Driver, and then Joe Navarro, who's a leading body expert, world renowned, he has a great talk on YouTube called The Power of Nonverbal Communication, huge eye opener for me. And lastly, Amy Cuddy, she has a great TED, TED talk where she talks about how body language may shape who you are, and she talks a lot about confidence in that piece. So those are my three recommendations that I hope you'll find helpful. Great. And if any of you missed that, we'll have Stacy type that in towards the end yes. of, okay. the, of our learning lab so that you also can capture what those great resources are. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stacy. Let's go to your third point. Know your crowd. Talk to us about that. Right. So knowing your crowd is very, very important. I call it doing an audience analysis. And that means you're going to take the time, if you're invited to speak at an event or you're doing a presentation in a boardroom among, among your coworkers, what is the age demographic? What is the you know, cultural or social economic makeup of this group so that you can kind of tailor your message in a way that speaks to them? Because you want to really connect and build rapport with your audience, whether it's a small intimate group or it's a large group. Um, when it comes to the larger groups, say you're speaking in front of hundreds of people, you have to be aware, or I would suggest being aware of customs and traditions. So what we might find acceptable in Western society may not be acceptable in India and different parts of the world. So I try to have a global mind when I'm doing things and being aware and respectful of people's customs and traditions. Often, um, if you're speaking at say a high level event where maybe a gala, I, I plan a lot of those things. There's sometimes dignitaries or diplomats of these things. So try to find out who's in the room. If the host hasn't acknowledged or thanked those people, if that's a good opportunity for you as a keynote speaker, if that's what you're doing to do so. So those are some tips in terms of uh, knowing your crowd. And um, in terms of the age appropriate tips, I try to do things that are appropriate maybe for student crowd versus an older generation. So for younger people or people who are technically savvy, I'll really engage in the social media and get them to tweet things like that. Older crowd, I might open with a poll or a question. So if you have a question coming in? Yeah, Stacey, this is actually a question that was way back, but might be oh. interesting actually now. It's from Sylvie Gould and she asked, is it okay to admit that you don't know something in a group setting? 
And I think it might cue back to know your crowd. So I'll leave that question with you. What do you think? Is it okay to admit you don't know something when you're standing in a group setting and talking to them? Right. Well, yeah, it depends on the group. You want to be honest and give accurate information. You don't want to mislead or misinform anybody. So sometimes it's good to say, I don't know the answer for that. Is there someone else? in the room that may can speak to that because you don't know who's in the room. There could be experts, right? Um, or you could ask for an opportunity to look for the answer and get it to them. So it really depends on the type of event that it is. And I've been in situations where there is an expert that can comment and speak on something, especially on, on the municipal board that I'm on, right? We have a lot of experts on different aspects of health that really focus on some really um, area that I'm not an expert on that I can speak to. So we look to them to kind of elaborate on certain things. So that's a good opportunity to do that. Yeah. That's great. And then how do you go about um, actually knowing your crowd in terms of the research or the, because it might be a large audience of 100 mm -hmm. people. Um, like, what are some of the ways you've done that in the past, Stacey? Well, I mean, it's a, again, depends. So if I'm speaking in an academic setting and, you know, the people organizing it may have that information. Um, if it's at like a charity gala, like I usually go to the event planners, the hosts, the organizers, but say if it's just like an outdoor family fun, you know, barbecue, you want to use language that would be age appropriate for a senior and a five-year-old, right? You don't want to be using these jargons and these big terms that, you know, you'd have to be in an academic setting for people to understand. So that's been my general rule of thumb to really, you know, keep things simple. But if in your state academic setting, and you, you happen to be a lawyer and they ask you to speak on something, you can use the legal jargon if you know the majority of the people are, are lawyers, for example. So I just try to, you know, that's kind of my rule of thumb of what I do. Great. Anything else around this uh, know your crowd, your, your third key takeaway for us? Um, in terms of, I mean, in terms of knowing your crowd, one of the, the last takeaway I would share is avoiding assumptions. You know, don't assume that something that might be funny to you, it's funny to the group you're speaking to, making culturally insensitive comments or things like that. Like sometimes you do have to use common sense with certain things, right? But when you make assumptions or you assume things, you can end up in those traps and it can end up being a big blunder if like you're a really high profile person that ends up on the media, right? So be really aware of, of, of the things you'll say and how you're saying things. And it's always good to get, you know, feedback, from other people, you may have friends from different groups and be like, you know, if I say this, would this be appropriate? And they could say, actually, no, because in my culture, it might be interpreted as such. So don't make assumptions. Wow, what a difference if people thought about that more frequently just in their day-to-day -day communication, right? Yes, exactly, right. That's great, good. Okay, Stacey, let's get to your fourth point, strengthen your narrative. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna focus on how to strengthen your narrative, especially through media. So if you're a professional who has the opportunity to talk about, you know, your role in a company that you work for, you're the CEO of a company or an entrepreneur like myself, there's a few key things that I learned. But interestingly enough, I learned this while I was a core director uh, for a local TV station here. So I had the opportunity to be behind the scenes of seeing so many people, whether it's a chef, whether it's inventors, professionals of all walks of life talk about who they are, what they do. There's times when they spoke on specific issues, but there's times where they're just displaying a product or a service that they provided. And so I learned that it was really important when you have an opportunity to share your message, whether it's radio or TV, to be clear on your intentions, right? Why are you speaking? Why are you there? Is it to inform? Is it to inspire? Is it to persuade? Is it to entertain, right? So once you're clear on that, you're gonna go in with that direction. Also being clear on the message. What is the message that you want the audience to get? Sometimes there's something such as important as a website for a company or our social media that we don't leave. So then what was the point of going on there? It's not all the time the teleprompters will work over you remember to include that. So you have to make sure you say there's three things that doesn't matter what we talk about or the, the host asks me, I got to make sure I get these three things out. So something, for example, like your contact information is one of those key things you want to get out. Um, and again, depending on... Um, while you're going on TV, one of the things you want to be clear on is that what is it you're going to be promoting? Is it your business? Is it an issue, right? Is it an event? Or are you just doing an interview on a topic? Is it, you know, a commentary on current affairs or something like that? So being clear on what this, this opportunity is about, because it is a great opportunity. And one of the things that will allow you to do is just amplify um, your profile, 
your network, and you just get your message out to a larger audience. But for me, those are some of the key ways that I've been able to, to do that better. And Stacy, how have you created those opportunities for yourself? I mean, specifically through media, because that's something that a lot of our attendees may be interested in doing. You know, have you found any um, key success factors or ways that have made you um, more um, appealing to, to, to media or to other outlets? Um, I mean, when I first had my first opportunity to be like on camera, it was actually on CBC. It's because I was involved with a social awareness campaign that got international attention and it was on the Ebola virus and everybody knows that was all the news. But I was able to build a advocacy campaign from scratch in partnership with York University that was just really, um, it was very grassroots, but it was also very impactful because we were able to get 2000 signatures that an MP who's now a cabinet minister presented in the House of Commons when the current government was in opposition. And so th those kinds of things just gave me an opportunity where it came to me and I wasn't looking for it. So I had to just get prepared <laughs> really quick. But once I transitioned into entrepreneurship, I also over that opportunity made some great connections with producers and you know, different reporters and TV hosts. So, you know, through relationship building, I would reach out to say, you know, I now have a company, this is what I'm doing. And like I said, when I was a floor director, I spent over a year doing that at a local TV station and I had great relationships already from before, which I maintained. And so reaching out to them, I had the existing relationship. It was great. So for me, it comes down to networking and your approach. One of the things I learned when it comes to reaching out to the media, don't ever say, did you get my email? They did get your email. They get thousands of emails. They don't have time to read it. If they like your pitch and your story, they will contact you. They will find you if they need to. And so that has been my experience because of some of the social advocacy things I'm involved in. I'm also involved in a campaign about breast cancer and we've had opportunities to be on TV for that issue, right? So they reached out to us because the issue was newsworthy for that outlet. So it was my networking and things I'm passionate about sometimes created and led to these opportunities, but then I made sure to maintain the connections that I made over time. And so is there sort of a, a secret number in terms of frequency? Like, you know, you don't want to be pestering them, but, you know, if you're in touch with the different areas you're working on or the interesting things, is there sort of a, a, a number that you have found to work for you or you, you well I mean it's, I don't really have a number I'm just big on reaching out to as many outlets as possible so if you do want to get on tv for an interview I mean there's people who will get publicists and people who are really savvy and you do have to pay for that service that's the first way to do it if you can but if you do have those connections and you're able to come up with a concept that you think will fit into something that could be a current affairs or if it's local or a radio station you just want to talk about your business and it's in the theme of something that's you want to tie it into something that people are talking about, I find helps. But for me, it's been my relationships. Like I know people who are in local radio and different things. So I've maintained that. So it isn't really just a magic number. You want to just cash your, your net out wide and yeah. see who responds. But when you get that response, you want to spend some time with, oh, thank you for your response. Because they might be a little interested, but they're not locking you in. So they sometimes will work with you. You know, I've had producers that will try to work with you and reshape what it is you might want to present to fit with something else they're doing to see if they can slide you in for that two minutes. It's not really a lot of air time most people get. So that that's what has worked for me. Terrific, great, good, good. Mm -hmm. Should we go on to your fifth? Yeah, so now to the fifth. Yeah. Uh, creating your own opportunity. Approaches to build your credibility for growth and advancement is really, really important, especially if you're an entrepreneur. So for me, I was, I've, I'm forced to create <laughs> opportunities because being laid off, was a huge challenge It happened in 2013, but I'm a very persistent person and have lots of resilience. I wasn't born with resilience, it was built over time. And one of the things that I was doing over and over, which people who have been employed has done, is sending out resumes. But I got to over 700, which I don't know how common that is. <laughs> and 700, not just in Canada, but I've applied to jobs in the Caribbean, in the States, industries, you name it. I was open to customer service, you name it. And this is with my master's in public policy, right? So that type of resilience has tr transferred into being an entrepreneur because you're going to have to knock on doors again to try to get clients, to get noticed, to build your brand, and you're going to hear silence, crickets, or you know, knock on doors, they might open and say, not now, right? So my journey of trying to find a job really helped me to build the resilience that I need as an entrepreneur because it does take time to do that. And so um, when I decided to launch my business, I knew that I had a network that I built over time 
which meant I had enough credibility because credibility is key. And you kind of start there before you can. And so in terms of creating your own opportunity, like you do have to be innovative, make the best out of the worst situation, because that's just sometimes with a competitive market, we're in a very competitive market, a lot of people trying to do similar things. And so if a door won't open, you have to build your own door. Like those are things that as I started to do, I was like, that's what that person meant when they say these things, you have to create your own, your own door and your own opportunity. And so um, there's some ways you can build your credibility. And some things that I have done, which I'd like to share with you is that it's important to be consistent, being dependable, um, under promise and over deliver. And that can go a long way because sometimes if you over deliver or you over promise, sorry, but then you can't deliver it, that can eat away to your reputation because people will say, well, I can't depend on this person. They said they would do X and that didn't happen. So I have a habit of under promising, but putting in that work and then over deliver to exceed expectations because you want to establish a reputation, whether you're a professional or an entrepreneur of excellence. Be open to feedback, right? Don't be so quick to get offended if somebody says that you should have done something a little bit better or maybe when you're presenting, perhaps you should have done that. Be open to that, right? Suggestions are helpful. It helps you to grow. And it's also important to deliver high quality work. It doesn't hurt to do things over and over until you get it right because it is your reputation. You're trying to establish credibility. And that's so important as professionals if you want to move up into a higher position, right? They're going to pick the people that are consistent, dependable, and do high quality work. Then it's also good to take time to reflect, evaluate, and adjust. Sometimes we're just going and going, doing multiple things, especially as women, we're like the masters of multitasking, but we don't really take time to just stop and reflect and assess like, are we growing? What can we do better? What can we do different? And then make those adjustments. That's really helpful, whether you're in business or you are a professional. That's great. And, um, you know, a lot coming through now on our chat. So a lot of additional tips, but uh, Kim McDonald actually posted something that if all of you didn't see this resource, it's probably worth writing down. It's www.helpareporter.com. And uh, Kim posted that is that's where reporters will make their request for where they're looking for subject matter experts. I think I got that right. I'm going back to your comment here. Yes, Kim. Thank, Thank you. you for that. That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. And then, you know, and I think you may have answered this. And, and so, Sylvia, I, I think that Stacy answered this, but she was just asking a question about she's, you know, new out of the gate and tips on um, how best to network in mm. the domain. So, you've covered quite a few. Is there anything else, you know, with a very specific question on how to, to network in this space? Yeah, I'll share a few quick tips on networking. I do have a call that I did on how to network effectively. So networking is not a risk to collect business cards. So when you're going to an event, don't try to meet every single person. You know, so if you're going, depending on the type of events, because there's events that go to where I'm going because I really just want to connect with the keynote speaker who's there. I made sure I did my research, read the, read the bio of the keynote speaker so that when I do approach him or her, I know what to talk about. I make some connection. Or you read their LinkedIn profile because not everybody has a website where you can easily find that and they may not have LinkedIn. So after you hear them speak, make some notes and try to build that rapport. So for me, networking is about building rapport with just genuine people who have shared interests. It's not about just handing out your business cards or collecting business cards because it's hard to build real relationships like that. And so for me, that's how I have over time been able to you know, expand my network and ensure that it's diverse. That's great. Good. Thank you for that. Um, any other points around the uh, building credibility for growth and advancement, Stacey? Um, yeah, well, just to, yeah, well, for growth and advancement, I was indicating before, if you're a professional, once you've been able to do some of those things that I've indicated around being, um, being reliable and dependent and consistent and producing high quality work, there's always opportunities in major companies for promotion and they're going to give it to those people who have delivered and have that good credibility that they know they can rely on because this is not just your personal reputation, but a company or sometimes billions of dollars, depending on what the opportunity is. And so, you know, keep that in mind as you're in a company and it doesn't matter what level you start off and you can start a very entry level and easily get to the top. And it's not just about our accolades all the time. It's about our ability to deliver. Right? It really comes down to ability to deliver and to do so consistently. And the thing goes for business, because if you want to land a certain contract with a certain client, your ability to have that credibility is very, very important. 
right and so i you know someone who can bring their voice forward in you know a group environment like you're doing right now sort of what do you think comes first you know sort of that chicken egg credibility or the strong voice put you on the spot here yeah yeah well i mean people will be captivated by a strong voice and a strong presence and you could do a great speech and all of that. And it's really, if you get to know the person, then you're like, oh, you know, they talk a good talk, but are they walking it, right? Yes. So you could do that and that's fine and put yourself out there. But I always believe to back yourself up with some substance. You should, you know, walk the talk and talk, you know, it, you should do that. It, it's important. It just will add, give you more value and just make you have a better credibility. But it does either way, you could do either one, right? And then there's some people that they may set these high expectations and then they can't deliver. And then you can work on that, right? We're not, we're people, like we evolve, we grow, we can work on things and become better, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's it. Well, and that's interesting because, uh, you know, I was thinking as you were speaking about this adage of great speakers aren't born, they're created. And mm -hmm. you know, your points about developing your capabilities as a speaker mm -hmm. about all of these. So if anyone doubts themselves, mm -hmm. don't just look at the current state, right? Continue, right. you know, put yourself forward. Yeah. And invest in yourself. And there's so many great resources where we could do that. I mean, now we're lucky to have YouTube. You can just literally Google a lot of things on, you know, and find great examples of public speaking and some of the things I indicate and work on these things. There's videos on just correct breathing and deep breathing that helps you so much with projecting your voice and just speaking from your diaphragm something as simple as focusing on that can make a huge difference with your speech as well right so it doesn't have to be every little aspect because that could be overwhelming just take one piece at a time and develop one aspect at a time of yourself yeah I love that that's great Stacy good well let's uh move on here and and uh get a little personal with you <laughs> so we've got your favorite quote here from Dr. Martin Luther King and, and why don't you tell us why that was your your favorite quote that you wanted to share with us all. Right so faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the entire staircase. That is a very powerful quote for me because I am a person of faith but also when it comes to starting a business right it's in our head and then we have to get it out of our head. And you have to have a lot of faith to believe this is going to work no matter what. I can't, I may not see what it's going to look like, but I'm just going to jump out there, step out of my comfort zone and believe that it will work. And that's also speaks to success, right? You want to be a successful professional. You don't, you don't know, right? But you're going to believe that it's possible and you're not sure what's going to be, you know, at the end of being at a company for five years, you might think, you know what, I'm just going to be here for two years and just do this little position. And next, you know, you end up in a bigger position than you thought or there's some other opportunity that came up but you couldn't see it at that time so whether you could see the end result or you could see the end of that staircase you've got to have that faith like for me it's the foundation of everything that will keep us moving and motivated and inspired even when life tries to knock us down and Stacy, how do you um keep your faith nourished I will say how do I keep my face nourished? Yeah. Well, I mean, surrounding myself with people who have my best interests at heart, I call them my support system. I've been very fortunate to have a great support system. I have older mentors, I have people my age, and then people that I mentor as well. You know, giving back to them and then seeing them growing just gives me the faith to keep moving and knowing that I'm not in this world alone. I'm not on an island on my own. I have a huge community that supports me that I'm very grateful for, family and friends. And so that that kind of keeps me, you know, fueling my faith as well as, um, you know, reading religious uh, scriptures as well kind of helps me center myself with the spiritual part of who I am as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm. Tell us about um, a book you're reading right now that you'd like to share with everyone that's also possibly feeding your faith or <laughs> you know one of the books that I'm reading which is it's really interesting because I actually have an interesting story of the author so the author is a film producer who interned for Will Smith who's now a well-known producer in America called Devon his name is Devon Franklin and in 2016 I had the opportunity to interview him in person for a magazine that I write for and he graced the cover the whole story is amazing so his newest book is called The Hollywood Commandments and what's interesting about that book he takes spiritual concepts and applies it to being a professional. So he's a Hollywood producer, but he talks about how you can negotiate and know your worth and these different things that we kind of hesitate in doing and how that has helped him 
in his 10 year career to be at the top of the producer game. And he's produced some very big films, Pursuit of Happiness, um, Heaven Must Be Real and the list goes on and he's still doing script films and this is his third book and he's fairly young. So I find his book to be just very practical and it doesn't just speak to your mind, but it speaks to your spirit and it's so motivating, right? And then meeting him on top of it was just a bonus because when I met him, I'm like, this guy really practices like what he says in his book. He's not just talking. So, you know, that's definitely one of my favorite uh, books. And how did you meet him? Um, well, what happened was it was weird. So <laughs> someone <laughs> tried to add me on Facebook and by scrolling their page, I saw a flyer that he was coming. But prior to that, I was working on the issue for the magazine that wasn't supposed to be a men's issue. It was a Mother's Day issue. And all I was going to do was a review, review of Miracles from Heaven, his movie. Like, I'm just going to write a review. But I said, wouldn't it have been cool to maybe interview, like, one of the producers on his film? What are the chances of that? So I'm here working on the review. And the founder of the magazine was pressuring me. They say, see, I, got, I want to go to print, get this going. I'm like, don't worry. And I'm working on it. So I got this Facebook ad, friend request. And as I'm scrolling the page of this person, I see a flyer that Devon Franklin is coming to Toronto. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> so what type of personality I have, I'm like, I know this is a men's only conference, but I'm going to figure out how to get there. And yeah. so once I told the founder of the magazine, we reached out to the organizers, first found who the organizers were. And when we told them what we're doing in the magazine, they were like, you know what? You can come in, you can cover the whole event. We'd love to have you guys. And next thing you know, I'm sitting with him for two hours. So of course I'm, I'm up till three o'clock preparing myself because I'm like, what are the chances? Wow. You know, so you put in the work and you deliver. And it turned out to be a very successful magazine and on the fly um, interview, sorry. And on the fly, we said, would you grace the cover? He said, sure, why not? We kept him on the cover of issue nine for Soulful Image magazine. So it was really, really a cool experience. Stacey, you are demonstrating um, how to be resourceful also throughout this this learning lab right while it may not be one of the uh you know the key takeaway learnings that you're highlighting you are a very resourceful woman and you're de demonstrating to us again and again mm -hmm. your resourcefulness of just going out there mm -hmm. and going for it and for the most part you land on your feet yeah to make it happen you just yeah, have to make, make, it happen. make it happen no matter what <laughs> yeah you pull the world towards you that's terrific yes, yes. on that Thank note you. who um, right now is inspiring you. Is there someone standing out that you'd just like to highlight to us that, uh, that you are gaining inspiration from a person or people? Yeah, um, I mean, there's two people who inspire me. And as you know, I have a book coming out in July. You know, one person who's my mom, she's no longer here. But she, I mean, she was my rock. And it was because of her heart for just humanity and people and how she just invested in the lives of these children that she tutored and her friends. And so, and she was just my cheerleader. Like every time I felt like giving up, she'll say a quitter never wins, a winner never quits. You got to keep going. And so I just had that growing up and I, I feel like I have it in reserve. I mean, <laughs> she's gone. I had so much of it. Like she just poured in all these great things that I now have in reserve. And then my older sister, who's just a phenomenal um, woman, who, a mother of six, like she just, just thinking of her always gets me inspired. And she was very instrumental in how I was raised and things like that. And so, I mean, these are just women who are humble and who are just, you know, forgiving. And they have those qualities that whether you have a lot of accolades or not, like those are the qualities I want to emulate. Like I want to have a legacy where I'm remembered for being compassionate and caring and genuine and you know, bringing people along with me. If a door of opportunity opens, I don't believe in walking through it alone. I always have to take some of it because I know how hard it is. Yeah. And Anne is wondering, first of all, she says, congratulations to you on your book, but what's the title? Thank state? you. Oh, the title of my book is Deeper Reflections of Life. Hmm. Words to inspire the heart and uplift the soul. And that's actually a title that my mom approved before she passed away because it was something I was talking about for years. And she's like, I like that title. So I can't change it. That's great. And uh, where are we going to be able to get your book when it is finished? Well, my launch will be on July 22nd. I am in the process of planning my book launch and then it'll be on Amazon online on my website. So I'm actually in the process of just setting all of that up and I'll be launching a personal website, Stacey Avery website around that time as well. Terrific. Good. And of course, our Shio workplace will be able to, we'll find out about that too, right? Yes, of course. Yes, all I'll right. be sharing that. <laughs> Very good. So what's the next leg of your journey, Stacey? 
It's been well, amazing so far. What's next for you? Well, so what's next for me? Like I said, I'm launching my book, but I also am a co-author of another book. I completed the chapter 365 Empowering Stories with Randy Goodman, who's well known as an international uh, bestseller. So I completed my chapter on that and it's about how you can use faith to conquer fear. And then I'll be working on a third book. I started the table of contents and I'll be targeting entrepreneurs with a few success tips. So that's pretty much uh, what's next for me. So I really am going to be launching myself as a writer and an author, and I'm really excited about it. Terrific. That is just super. So now is an opportunity just for everybody to, uh, they've probably been listening intently, just to take a moment and to capture any other notes as we sort of wrap up the formal part of our learning lab today. In a moment, we're going to move to a pure Q&A with, a pure Q&A with Stacy, where you can just ask questions on the chat and uh, put them to her directly. But before we do that, just grab your canvas, Insight to Action, take a couple more notes for yourself. And as you're doing that, you might find you have more questions for Stacy. And as we proceed, as you're doing that, I will share with you our next learning lab, which is going to be on June 16th. And that will be 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific. And that's going to be with Carolyn Meacher. And she is the chief people officer of Refinery29. Refinery29, which is a leading digital media company for young women, is headquartered in New York City. And they also have spaces though worldwide in Los Angeles, London, Berlin, and Toronto, and they employ over 450 people in those many locations around the world. And Carolyn's topic is going to be around creating the conditions for your team to do their best work and the impact on your bottom line if you don't. So when I connected with Carolyn about this, we were talking about the fact there really isn't a line on your income statement or your profit loss statement that captures where if you're not allowing your team or providing the conditions for your team to do their best work, it's hard to measure that. So she's going to speak to what her experience has been of where it can impact your bottom line and how if you actually aren't creating the conditions for this great work. And, you know, Stacey, you, as you were speaking, were really, you know, talking about leadership also, Mm -hmm. creating conditions for your own success and the people that you collaborate with. So it's really interesting, mm -hmm. you know, coming from our first learning lab and what Julie was sharing in that one, which is available on our SHEO website, by the way. Mm -hmm. that was a good our first, that's right. Our first learning lab. You can go back and watch that again. And Stacy's will be available also. Mm -hmm. And um, probably in the next 24 hours, you'll be able to access that one and watch again and uh, listen to Stacy on all her great points. So I hope that you'll be able to join us for our next learning lab on June the 16th, because we are excited to do that one again with, with Carolyn. Just seeing if there's any other quick questions here. And as we get ourselves ready for our next section, I just want to remind you how to take this learning forward. One is if you aren't already in the SHEO network, you can become an activator and there's information on our SHEO website to do that. We are going to open up a Slack channel that you can connect with all the other amazing women who have been on this um, learning lab. And at one point I saw, I think there's about 230, 240 people online and uh, they'll be there. So um, we also um, are going to be heading into our Q and A. And if you want to keep on learning within my network, it's www.entrepreneursvelocity.com where there will be other tools and things for entrepreneurs specifically to take their business to the next level. Marissa has just posted in the chat the, the Slack channel you can join. However, we will formally say goodbye to people if they need to run to their next meeting, maybe put the kids to bed, whatever that may look like, depending on the time zone that you're in. And Stacey, we're going to open up the, uh, the chat right now. So, okay. Yeah. So, gang, we have Stacey for about another 10 minutes, give or take. Mm -hmm. And um, let's, uh, if you've got a question, just say yes and type that question in. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to unmute everybody. So just be mindful. I'm unmuting you all. 
So we'll hear everybody now. So you can just say yes, I'll call your name out and you can ask that question directly to Stacy. Here we go. Awesome. You're all unmuted. Does anybody have a question that they would like to directly ask? Yes, Emily, please. Emily Mills. Oh, Emily. <laughs> I've unmuted you. I'm oh, uh, unmute all. Maybe Marissa, maybe you have to unmute everybody. Do you? Mm -hmm. Let's just hold on, Emily. We're just getting the logistics. Oh, here we go. I've got it. I did it. Emily, back to you. No? Hmm. Oh, I thought it said I'd unmuted everybody. Maybe, Emily, you need to unmute something. <laughs> Let's see. Anyone else have a question? And, Emily, I'm just going to, can someone just, can anyone else say, is anyone able to say a word? Or perhaps I, they could type it, maybe? The typing looks like it works. I'm yeah, looking. I'm sorry, gang. It seemed to uh, indicate that you'd be all unmuted, but it doesn't seem. You know what, Emily, just a second. I'm going to try this another way. Give me a second. Emily, can we hear you? Aha. Uh -huh. No, it's not allowing. Um, I'm going to ask Marissa at our SHEO admin. Can you unmute Emily? No. Okay, Emily, do you mind typing out your question? We seem to be having a problem. Um, you know what I'm going to ask? There's Francis. Francis has a question for tips for okay. building resilience, Stacey, as we figure out what Emily was going to share with us. Hmm. She'll be typing that out. And what do tips do you have for building resilience, Stacey? Building resilience. So, I mean, for me, it's like when you get a rejection and you're shut down, you do feel like defeated. <laughs> so self-care is a, is a first step, making sure you're eating well, healthy, nutritious food and getting enough sleep so that you can refuel and just go at life again you ch and try again. Right. So it's taking that time to refuel, um, doing those self-assessments are ways that I have built resilience when um, facing rejection as well as just having that ability to try again, not being afraid of failure has helped as well. Uh, and surrounding myself with my support system and going to them for that advice, right? When I feel shut down. So making sure you have that support system, you practice self-care and positive self-talk. Great. Thank you, Stacey. That's great. And we got at least question typed out here. Just and can you guys hear me? Hey, I oh, can. Oh, now we do. Hi, Emily. Hey. hey. Okay. Sorry, hey. I was like, oh, I didn't press something. Hey, okay. I have, I have two quick questions, so pick which one you want to answer. One was, how do you prepare for a keynote speech versus a group presentation? Like, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. And my second question would be, uh, any tips on how to speak with confidence about something that might be really challenging for you personally? Mm, okay, those are some good questions. So keynote versus group. Uh, so with the group presentations, I like to incorporate doing a PowerPoint and slides. And one of the things I shifted away from is using more pictures or images, even sometimes my personal, my own personal photos, um, as opposed to all these texts and words. Nobody wants to see that. You can tell a great picture, a great, deliver a great message with pictures. Uh, with a keynote, I do actually write a formal speech and practice it, but I do not write every single word I'm going to say. So I do like talking points and these headings so that I can remind myself of where I want to go next, especially for a keynote presentation. I like to incorporate a personal story because it's easy to memorize. And then your other question was about confidence. How, how do you speak with confidence when the subject matter might be really challenging for you? For example, you know, there's a lot of women who are now being asked to speak about their identity as a woman in the Me Too era. Mm. If they're, let's say, in the corporate context or something, you know, those can be very difficult conversations to now give voice to. So any advice on how to do that, if it's kind of something that might be a bit challenging for you personally? Well, to and, okay. And so, and thank you for clarifying. Those are heavy topics and it is hard and it puts you in a vulnerable situation. So, I mean, first, before I say yes to something, I want to make sure I'm in a safe space and I'm comfortable because I was saying before, just because you're asked to do something, it doesn't mean you should. So first you want to make sure 
you're ready and you feel comfortable doing this. And if there's an opportunity to find out from the host of the person asking, how interactive can this be? So is it a space where other people can perhaps open up so you're not talking just to them and putting yourself out there, but you're having a conversation with others on this issue might be a, a good approach that I would suggest. Thank you. Okay. Emily, thank you very much. Good to hear your voice. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Anyone else have it? I think I'm figuring out now how we get to the unmuting. There's a couple steps. So uh, anyone else? If you just type a yes, I can send that over to Stacy. Mm -hmm. Looks like Ingrid's also typing in the responses also. So yeah, I can see the chat box as yeah. well. That's yeah. Great. <laughs> That's great. Good. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we have any other questions, Stacy, but I guess. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as we you know move forward here and wrap up, mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing you briefly talked about is your, um, you know, your work in politics, and uh, I'm just wondering also because I think no matter uh, where uh, you know the different women are who are attending today's. Uh, learning lab are from, we know we have a real underrepresentation of women and women of color in the political fields. Mm -hmm. So any rallying cry or um, reflection on that as we bring ourselves forward as women inside of the political domain? And I mean, um, just to a shout out to New Zealand <laughs> with their uh, prime minister who is a woman. Wonderful, uh, yeah. That's, that's right? Certainly the minority and taking maternity leave as I think as we speak. Mm -hmm. but, any you know reflection on that, Stacy, from what you've seen and maybe mistakes women might be making, which could be inhibiting, um, inhibiting our capabilities or our voice in that domain. Oh, wow, that's a, that's a, like another thirty well, that's minutes. That's a whole other learning lab, that's right? That's a whole other yeah learning lab. Um, I mean, one of the things I always say, you know, strive to go where you don't see yourself or see people who look like you and just not being afraid to go in those spaces. We do need more courageous and brave women in politics who will speak up and speak out. We do have um, some great women doing that already. And it's good to um, understand how to be allies uh, to those women. And you don't always have to speak for them to be their ally, but just having that empathy and, and understanding what it means to have empathy and really building um, under good understanding of where they're coming from. And sometimes just being a good listener, but when you see something that's wrong, knowing that you know if you're really gonna be an ally, speaking up at that point, when you see uh, something that's going wrong. But we do have a long way to go in terms of representation for people of color, getting more women in politics. So it is important to be civically engaged, you know, voting, understanding the electoral process, are ways that we can start. Like, I wish I had more time to really dig deeper because there's so many things we can do to change that. But it's great to see that there are women all across the world changing that, um, getting nominations. There was a historic win in the States, I think Atlanta for Stacey Adams is her name, where she got a historic nomination to run for governor, which has never been done. So there's some great things happening. And I like to look to those stories of inspiration to let me know it can be done, it's possible. There's people doing it, you know? So surround yourself with those movers and shakers and the ones that are there continue you need to support them, is what I would say. Emma, um, Emma, I have just promoted you to a panelist because of the version of Zoom you have doesn't allow you, us to hear your voice. <laughs> Hello, Emma. And you had a great question, and I really wanted Stacy to have it from, to hear it from your voice. So uh, I hope you don't mind that I suddenly Zoomed us into your living room. <laughs> So, Em, I don't know if you can uh, take yourself off mute and if we could hear from you. Let's see. Unmute. Here, give it a whirl. Emma, can you hear us? All right. I'm going to pose Emma's question. And if Emma is able to jump on, that would be great. So she said, as a woman of color, my challenge is speaking up and speaking articulately. Any tips? For speaking up and speaking articulately? Yes. Hmm. As a woman of color. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it, it, it took a lot of practice, constantly speaking in different spaces. And then on issues, that, like I said, um, 
can be heavy. I'm involved in like a breast cancer awareness campaign that is not a light topic. I mean, I lost my mom to that issue, to cancer. So the advocacy and being an advocate kind of helps to develop that skill when you're involved in issues that you're passionate about. Um, spending a lot of time reading about other advocates and reading books to pick up the kind of vocabulary and language that's needed. I mean, I did study history and law and society. So I have that, it's something that's just in you, but you develop it over time and, and people can develop. They take the time to study, do the research, listen to other speakers who are women of color who are powerful and fierce. And just taking that time to rehearse, you know, rehearsing your message, speaking in front of a mirror. There's, there's so many things you can do and it takes time and being open to feedback from those in your personal circle who will be honest with you and, and you know, let you know how you can do better. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, I think we all have our, you know, our responsibility, maybe that's a strong word to use, but that we also um, sometimes um, step back to allow others to have their voice be heard and to make sure and look around the room if we've been doing this for a while to have their voice be heard mm -hmm. and uh vicky and vicky saunders for those of you who may be joining our community and don't know who vicky saunders is she's the founder of she oh she put a post up the other day where there was a panel going on and it was all women but they there was no women of color mm, and said, i saw that right so it's she's like no, i'm going to step back if mm -hmm. there are other, you know, if there aren't women of color on the panel that I would be joining. So sometimes we have to look around and go, hey, if we suddenly become the majority, right? we may need to step back to have other people's voices be heard. Exactly. That, right? And that's so Basically. powerful of Vicky. I was so inspired when I read her letter. That's a really powerful gesture to make. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can't, you know, we just keep on looking forward in terms of what that might be. And Stacey, you're incredibly confident. So if you're in a room, you're going to lend that to others and we just exactly speak up, exactly right? i don't always have to speak up exactly yeah and you know and encouraging others to do so or asking to hear their voice and to yes. some people are asking where can they post a question so maybe reminding them they can you can type your question if your mic isn't working yeah I saw a message about where can they post a question someone made a suggestion about a book which is great around building resilience, 21 Days to Resilience is a book to read written by a woman author, doctor doing research in this area. Thank you so much, uh, Arima, for sharing that. Great, good. This is great. <laughs> yep, good. Any last questions for Stacy here before we wrap up? we got a minute or two before we say adieu and head to the Slack channel. Anything yeah. else? I think one's being typed up right now. Okay. Okay, is there a place for humor when giving a speech? <laughs> um, once you do your audience analysis and you kind of know your crowd, like is this a, like a uptight, you know, crowd? Are they more relaxed? Are they like, you know, a liberal crowd, like young millennials, you know? So you can in probably insert some humor um, once you've done your audience analysis so that it's appropriate and it fits uh, who your target audience is, right? So spending that time doing that research is helpful. And then somebody else coming with a question. I don't know if we have time for this one. It's a bit long, but. I think let's grab Stacy's question. And it says here, everybody, Stacy's, whoops, it just zoomed past us. Oh. Used to be really good at public speaking. And then um, as I got older, I got more scared. Mm. And you spoke to 10 people. It was terrible. Your voice was shaky and you thought you would throw up and it oh. just got worse. Steph, I'm sorry to hear this. Sorry to hear this, yeah. So now you are terrified. So really a, a breakdown, had a breakdown. And where's the opportunity for maybe a breakthrough in that situation or a boost up for... for... Oh, so I've seen yeah. what happened. So you had a talk that went bad. So I'm seeing your last line, you said it was a train wreck. So don't replay that situation in your mind of the one talk that went bad. You have to try to get to a place where I say that is not who you are right? You can, and you were a, a great public speaker and you can get back there. So you may need to take some time uh, to do those positive affirmations and positive self-talk. And even if it was a very small crowd of 10, maybe start with just having a conversation for three friends, then move to 10 friends and then gradually build up. So then once you get past 10, you know, you're back on your feet. Usually when somebody was on their feet and they're exceptional, they can get back up again. And you have to believe that you can get back up again. It happens to athletes. I mean, look at Hussein Bolt, fastest guy in the world that lost. 
when people are like, how could you lose in your last go around? But you know what? You, you pick up the pieces, which is something my mom would say, and you keep it moving, right? Don't let one bad talk prevent you from doing what you know you're good at. So I really hope uh, that helps you. And I'm sorry to hear you have that experience. Stacey, that's a great way to finish things off. And before I take an opportunity to acknowledge you, I also want to thank Ingrid Green, who has been typing out a lot of the commentary so that it doesn't get lost, filling in links to books, et cetera. So Ingrid, thanks so much for doing all that. We really appreciate it. And Stacey, thank you so much to you. Remind us again where we can find you. So you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at the Stellar Group, and that's B-S-T-E-L-L-A-R group. My website is bestellargroup.com, and my email is info at bestellar group, or you can call me 416-214-6899, which is my business number. And thank you to each and every one of you who tuned in uh, to tonight's conversation. I really hope you found something valuable, and have a lovely evening. Stacy, thank you so much for your time, your energy, your generosity in sharing all of these great ideas, takeaways, your experience. Very, very inspiring also. Thank you. And it's just such a pleasure to have this conversation with you and to have worked with you. And you are just another example of the amazing network here at SHEO of Women. Yes, and I love the SHEO family. It's great. <laughs> you got it. And what we're up to here, right? Arm yes. in arm. Yes. Taking on the world as all of you who have joined us from around the world. Thank you. We saw so many places that you were, you were um, zooming in from and we appreciate it. And we hope to see you in June at our next learning lab. Just a reminder, you'll be able to watch this learning lab again at the SHEO website. And the first one we had with Julie Barker Mers around owning your power. And I hope to see you in June again. Thanks to all. Please give us your feedback. We are a work in progress here as we're building the Learning Lab out. And we want your feedback so that we can continue to get better, to serve you well, and to keep supporting each and every one of you in this network and beyond. So wherever you are, have a great evening, have a great afternoon, or have a great morning or lunch hour. And uh, back at you again in June. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, bye Stacy. Thank you. Okay, bye, Marcia. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.